Uh, I cannot tell you how honored we are to have our next guest here in studio with us. Uh, he is a uh, he's a friend of mine who I called uh, earlier this week and just had an idea of getting him in for an interview and so compliant, said whatever we needed, wherever we needed to go, wherever, what time. Uh, and here he is, Mr. Richard Lipsy, um, a, uh, a good friend of mine and, and, and somebody who is, uh, has such a well-respected name within our state. And I believe it is because of the passion that you have for our state of Louisiana that makes you so endearing to everyone. Uh, thank you and good morning. Thank you for, good for, morning. for being here. Jordy, I appreciate you inviting me on your show. I've watched it and it's very interesting and a lot of timely subjects. But uh, you're right. You said the right word. I'm passionate about Louisiana. I'm passionate about Baton Rouge. And, of course, I'm most particularly passionate about LSU. When did that start? Where did that start? Well, pretty easy. I, I went to the New High, University High School from grades 1 through 12 and then four more years on the LSU campus. So... I was a diehard LSU fan starting back in 1944 in the first grade. When? And uh, I, I just enjoyed LSU. After I got out of the service, I came back and, you know, joined the Alumni Association, went to the football games, and just have been very heavily involved uh, for so many years. And when you went away... For, for for service, uh, did you always have the mindset that you were coming back to to Baton Rouge, or when you went away, did you think that you were you will be gone for an extended amount of time? I, I really did believe I would be gone for an extended length of time. Well, my father wanted me to come back and run the business. I was in the service and I ended up in Washington D.C met a lot of people there and I was when I got out of the service I was offered an incredible opportunity to stay in Washington and work for a large insurance firm but at the same time it was just timing mm -hmm. my brother who was working with my dad at the time and he was an attorney but he was still working most of the time at the old Steinbergs, and uh, he moved out of town to go work in his wife's family business. And anyhow, when I came home after I got out of the service to recoup and yeah. think about my future life, of course, I went to work for Dad, you know, and while I was thinking about my options, and... That was 1964, and Dad literally just kind of turned the operations of the business over to me overnight. Wow. And wow. Uh, I won't say I was stuck with it because I've enjoyed every minute of it, but I, I missed my plan. I wanted to go to law school. I wanted to go to business school. And then when you start working, you don't think about those. Next things. thing you know, it's a decade later, right? That's right. It's Ten years later. Uh, Mr. Richard Lipsy in studio with us here at the Undisclosed location. Uh, can you take me back to November of 1963? What what that was oh, like wow. for you? So you are the, you're serving as the aide to the commanding general of the military district of Washington. Uh, and then shortly after that, uh, you are the only military member in the autopsy uh, that was performed on that November day for, for President JFK. That time in your life, what was that like? I, I know that you answer this question a lot, but this is just a fascinating period. Well, I'll, I'll try to give you the short version. You don't have it. to. But the short version of it is, is yes, the general was kind enough to take me from Fort Polk, Louisiana, with him back to, uh, to Washington when he was transferred as the commanding general there, and part of our duties were we met all foreign dignitaries that came into Washington. We took them, we introduced them to the president. We, uh, every formal event in Washington, 
we were responsible for. And so naturally one of the things was uh, state funerals. And we were preparing, you know, General Eisenhower is still alive, uh, as was General uh, President Truman and others. So we were prepared for this. And uh, when Kennedy, uh, President Kennedy was shot in Dallas, we heard about it. <clears throat> At the same time, the whole world heard about it. About 1 o'clock Washington time when we heard about it, uh, closer to 1.30, and uh, the general was coming out from lunch, and we had picked him up and just gotten in the car and, uh, we were on the way back to our office, got a call from the White House to come to the White House. And by the time we got there through heavy traffic, it was, I'll, I'll, I'll say it was stopped and stunned. People were just sitting in their cars uh, in disbelief. And so the next thing we know is, is we get a call in the car Remember, this is 1963, and right. we did have a phone in the wow. car at that time. What did that thing look like? <laughs> dr dr oh <laughs> dr direct to the White House, and they said, you know, the president's uh, been shot, and, uh, and the president's died, and we go to the White House, and by then there was nothing they could do. Wow. Uh, the president was dead, so we went to our office, started planning the funeral, and uh, went out to Andrews Air Force Base that evening. Uh, shortly after 5 o'clock, we went out there and waited for the plane from Dallas with the president's body. We took the body off the airplane, put it in a Navy hearse or Navy ambulance, really, and led the procession back to Bethesda Naval Hospital. Well, actually, our car did. General Wheel and I got on an Army, one of these old banana helicopters with the Marine Honor Guard and the Honor Guard from uh, Fort Myer, the same gentleman that guard the Tomb of the Unknown uh, Soldier, but they have their own burial group. And so we had... Uh, they were uh, from the 1st Army. So we got on this big helicopter. We flew, took a short time, landed, and very shortly thereafter, uh, the procession came in with the president's body. Well, General Wheel got out out front with Mrs. Kennedy, and they proceeded to go upstairs to the uh, 17th floor to the presidential suite to continue planning we already had a plan for a funeral, right. but we knew it had already been told that Jackie had specific uh, things that she wanted at, at the funeral. So the general handed me a 45 caliber pistol before we went out to Andrews Air Force Base. He says, when that body gets here, you don't leave it. Wow. So I went around the back of the hospital with the body we unloaded the president's body in the morgue. I took him out of his coffin that they had delivered it in, put him on the table, and the photographers came in, the technicians came in, and uh, we undressed the president and prepared him for the autopsy. Then the doctors came in, and then I sat there for three, little over three hours, just myself and the doctors. It's not like the movie JFK with a room full of people. It was just a couple of us in the room, and they performed the autopsy. After the autopsy was over, the president knocked on the door. I, I went to the door. This is LBJ. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I said president. I met the general, uh -huh. General Wheel, my boss. Knocked on the door. He said, let's lock this up and go change clothes. We were in our army greens. So we locked the door. I put a guard on the outside of the morgue door, the front and the back. 
we jumped in our car, we went back to Fort Myer, changed into our blue uniforms. At the same time, uh, we sent our car over to the White House to pick up the clothes that Mrs. Kennedy wanted the president buried in. We zoomed back. We were gone for a total of probably four thir- 40 minutes, I guess. Went back, and just as we got back, the people from Gawler's funeral home in Washington arrived. So I unlocked the morgue, went back in, and I sat there with the three gentlemen from Gawler's funeral home for three and a half more hours and watched them put the president back together. Uh, I got his clothes, I dressed him. Wow. Wow. And when it was over, I dressed him and I picked him up, put him in his coffin. And so theoretically, I I mean, I've got to, I mean, uh, was there ever a threat of security? When, when he handed you the no, five, no, was there no, ever, like the, mo- there was no the, the last movie that was made, Jackie, and she was came screaming down the hall wanting to see the body, but she never left the room upstairs. All baloney. There was no threat of security. Uh, I had no problem. The only th- about every few minutes, uh, an FBI agent would come in the room and ask me how much longer and I would confer with the doctors of the funeral home people, and then they'd go back out. About halfway through the autopsy, uh, about an hour into the autopsy, a knock on the door, and I went to the door, and it was uh, a person from the State Department. And they said, Lieutenant Lipsy, you need to sign this. And I said, what is it? They said, it's just a document, it says, and remember, this is 1963. Said if you cannot s- tell anyone what you is National Secrets Act, you cannot tell anyone what you've seen in this room for 15 years, wow. Wow. and wow. under penalty of twenty-five thousand dollar fine and or ten years in jail. So I signed it, and so for 15 years, I didn't tell anybody what went on in the room that night. How many times were you asked in those 15 well, years? Well, you know, seriously, the night that of the, uh, uh, of the, all this action that was going on and the, the, the funeral and everything going on at the same time, uh, I made one phone call actually to one to my parents and one to a cousin just to tell them mm. where I was because they said, oh, we saw you at Andrews Air Force Base when they got the, and I, I told them where, where I was, not what I was doing. And that was the extent of it. Wow. And I, I went home. I never discussed it with my parents or anyone for 15 years, and I'll end it with this. About a week or so after that 15-year period was up, and believe me, I was not keeping a calendar. I never gave it a thought. But 15 years later, which would have been 1978-ish, I'm going to 8 o'clock, I get to my office in the morning, and I opened the front door, that big front door of Steinberg's, and there was a black sedan parked out front. <laughs> oh, two, oh, my God. No way. Two guys got out of this black sedan and came up and said, are, are you Richard Lipsy? Yes. Were you in the United States Army in 1962, 3, 4? I said, yes. We said, we're the attorneys for the House Committee on Assassination. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to talk to you. So if you'd like to listen to that interview, just click on my name in, on the Internet, you know, on yeah. Google. I read it last night. And you, you can read that whole interview. I read it last night. The whole problem with that interview is that they, when they told me don't say anything for 15 years, I literally didn't. And they started asking me 
very specific questions. They had a chart, and the, you know about the president where he was shot, how many times he was shot, what did the doctors do, and so on and so forth. And, it, and they, they, I think they were trying to confuse me, but mm. I, I managed to get through that interview, and I, I realized I probably could have been a little more definitive, but. Um, I think I got it right. And, uh, just for the benefit of you all and the people listening today, there's no question in my mind one person, Lee Harvey Oswald, shot the president. There were no shots in any different direction. The, the bullets came from the rear. There were no, no other damage on his body. No, He was not shot from the front. I walked. I, I, I dressed him. I put him on the table. I saw the wounds. I've hunted all my life. I can tell the difference in an entrance and an exit wound. And uh, and then all the evidence just points to the guy in the school book depository in Dallas that fired the shots. The angles were right. I mean, th there's nothing to lead you to believe that anybody else fired a shot. Now, as far as a conspiracy theory, we could talk about that sure. for the next six hours. Let's don't get into that. How much did you consult Oliver Stone? How much did Oliver Not Stone? Not at all. Really? Not at all. Really? Not um, at all. Did you, what impact did that have on your life? You were such, you were so young at that time. I, I guess you didn't in the moment know what you were experiencing, the history you were experiencing presently, but what impact did that have on you as you grew? Very good question. I had never seen a dead man. Hmm. And here I am picking up the President of the United States out of a coffin and undressing him. Wow. And literally, I, I was sitting about as far as I am from you with, with, during the uh, autopsy, about six feet away. And watching him, watching them do the autopsy on the president. And it had a great impact on me, uh, especially about two months after I got out of the service, I received a box about uh, 18 inches square box from the United States Army, Washington, D.C. That's all it said to Richard Lipsy with my home address on it. Had no idea what it was. And I opened the box, and there was over 250 8 by 10 photographs of me from the time we got to Andrews Air Force Base until the time weeks after the funeral when we were taking dignitaries, like the last dignitary that I took to the see uh, the grave of President Kennedy was uh, Jackie Onassis, or at the time, Princess, well, Princess Kelly. Uh, and, and she could, didn't come to the funeral, long story, and uh, when she did come, she was Jackie's close friend. Jackie would not see her because she didn't come to the funeral. Wow. So they called General Wheel and said, you need to get to the uh, White House, pick up Princess Kelly and take her to the uh, grave site. So th there are just so many other stories, Jordy, about that and people we took and mm -hmm. uh, you know, just things that happened for the two years that I worked for President Kennedy. Uh, I worked for General Will during the day. And after I met and briefed President Kennedy on several occasions, he had asked me to be his social aide. Uh, I told him I'd love to, but I worked for General Will. That was my obligation. So he said, well, just work for us. Uh, work for me at night you know, when you're not working for General Wheel at social events here at the White House. So I, I did that for 
about the last six months that I was in Washington. So I had a lot, got to be very friendly with the president. And so, so much for that story. You want to talk about LSU? <laughs> I want to keep going. I want to keep going forever. Mr. Richard Lipsy is here. Uh, Daily, we're brought to you by Land Insurance. I know you know BG and the crew, L-A-N-O-I-X, agency.com. You need auto insurance, home insurance, business insurance. Get in touch with Randy, Brian, and David at 749-5640. 1977, you take over Steinberg's. Um, 1977. 63, 63. 64. What, what was it in 77 that changed? 77, I, I was in the retail business, Steinberg's, my whole life when I came back. And we're a retailer. And we just couldn't get, you know, we were, we had all kind of sports, you know, athletic shoes, athletic equipment. But the big focus of Steinberg's was hunting and fishing. Mm -hmm. And particularly guns. That's been my love all my life. I think you know that. Yes, sir. And we couldn't get the supply of guns that we needed, firearms. And so what I did is I bought a local wholesaler, very wonderful gentleman by the name of Bub McNutt, owned what was then called S&S Wholesale Sporting Goods. It uh, was located on Main Street, small building, had a nice, very small uh, little sporting goods distributorship, and they distributed uh, fishing and hunting equipment just basically it, it, around Louisiana. I, I'm sure they didn't go out of Louisiana. They only had two salesmen. Uh, the manager, whose name was Sid Neesom, and the salesman that started with him in 1953, Warren Virgits. Oh. And who his son Warren works for you now, LSU. right? Warren was an LSU player. Uh, he was an end on the team and a uh, hell of a football player and a hell of a man. And so uh, I bought, I bought uh, S&S. And I, I expanded it, we put in Converse shoes, and I became the distributor for the whole Southeast, Louisiana, uh, Southeast United States. And we grew, we built a big warehouse, literally across uh, South Boulevard from our store on St. Philip Street under the interstate. Okay. And Built, built a big building over there. We moved it over there. And that went on for about 10 years. 1985, I decided I needed a little better business education. My brother had gone before me to the Harvard Business School on a three-year MBA program but where you go in the summer for three years, or they have a fall program and a summer program. I chose the summer program. So for three summers, 85, 86, and 87, I went to Harvard to get my MBA. Uh, and, you know, it's very personalized, and you have lots of opportunity to talk to your classmates who are all, you have to be presidents or head of an organization to be in this program. And the professors, you have plenty of one-on-one -on -one time with the professors. And after all the discussions, they convinced me that I was trying to be all things to all people running retail stores and a wholesale operation and that I should decide what I wanted to be. Now, and I tell, I'm saying this because I, I, anybody listening to this podcast this morning should listen carefully. <laughs> you can't always do everything that you like. At some point in your life, you need to focus. <laughs> so what I did, I sold off my retail stores 
And then I sold off all the athletic equipment, all the fishing tackle, and decided that I would focus on selling firearms and solely firearms and nothing else. Think about it. You know, a rifle weighs seven pounds and you can put it in a box or a handgun weighs two pounds and you can put it in a box and you basically have a four or five or six hundred dollar package right there. Well, a pair of socks was, you know, six for a dollar in those days. <laughs> so you can either put a six pair of socks in a box for a dollar <laughs> and make, make, make 30 cents on it and ship it or you can put a $500 gun in a box and ship it and make, you know, 12%. We don't get a lot of margins, anywhere from 9 to 11%. So it was an easy, easy decision. <laughs> At it, Harvard it, Business School it, paid it, off, huh? <laughs> it, it, it really wasn't hard. I mean, <laughs> we started off, Jordy, in 1987. When I did that, there were 110 gun distributors in the United States. Today, there are about 22 you know, legitimate sure. gun distributors that buy directly from the manufacturers in the United States. 1987, we were the smallest. Today, you're the largest, right? Today, we're the largest. Right. Wow. What a testament. That's incredible. Richard Lipsy in studio with us. How are you on time? I don't want to disrespect your time. I, I, I've got... You you tell me who your next guest is. And I'll, we I'll we, leave. we get off we get off at we get off at nine a.m. We'd love to keep you until then. I, I can talk for Oof. a few more minutes. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, around that same time, Skip Bertman lands in Baton Rouge around the early eighties. Um, LSU baseball is off the map. Nobody knows about it. Uh, by the time the eighties are over, uh, they were about to knock down the door and become a powerhouse. Uh, the coaches committee that Skip Bertman mm -hmm. developed behind the scenes. You, uh, Mr. Blumberg, my grandfather, Frank Collada, were a part of the originating members. Um, can you talk about the rise of LSU baseball under Skip Bertman and you guys as businessmen being influential in that? Well, theoretically, there was a baseball team before Skip came, but there really right. what wasn't. I mean, uh, I... Over the years, I went to maybe two baseball games, and the f coaches then, right before Skip, Coach Smith, and uh, LeMay, mm -hmm. I, I knew them both well, but, you know, maybe sometimes 10, 20, 30 people would show up at a baseball game. And over the years, they had a, when they had a really good team, they, they would get a few more people, but nobody really knew about LSU baseball. Well, Skip came in with a plan. Bob Broadhead, as you know, was the uh, athletic director, and he had known Skip from Miami, and he he just knew Skip was the right man. Bob brought some good coaches he did. to LSU. He did. And so he brought this coach to LSU, and uh, I was among the first myself and Wally McMakin that uh, Bob called to meet uh, Skip. And, of course, Skip had a wife and four girls. I had my lovely wife, Susan, and two daughters. And my daughters were the same age as their daughters. And, uh, in the, of course, the catch right there was uh, – I was the only Jewish person in Baton Rouge that Bob Broadhead knew. Wow. And so he said, perfect match. We have a new Jewish baseball coach, and he'll match him up with us. Mazel tov. Wow. And so <laughs> it, it was absolutely one of the best moves that uh, Bob Broadhead ever made. And Susan and I have been so happy with uh, knowing Skip and Sandy all, and their family all these years. So. We, we took to each other immediately, and uh, Skip came to Baton Rouge, as you know. You've heard that story sure. so many times. He came with a plan. He had that yellow pad that he wrote on all the way from 
Miami to Baton Rouge with the list of things that he wanted to do when he got here. And he started working, and he checked them off one at a time as he accomplished them, everything from uh, painting the a locker room to getting new toilets installed to getting a washing machine to dryer to wash the baseball uniforms. Right. Uh, it, 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 such a simple things, but but things that would build morale, esprit de corps for the baseball team. And, of course, he was a champion at recruiting, and he was the pitching coach. And uh, Skip was terrific. And, you know, after that first year and the enthusiasm uh, that he built, uh, baseball was on the map at LSU. It was. It was. Um, the one story I'll tell you that I know you've heard, but it's Skip's favorite story to tell, is that uh, – in the very spring of the year, I think it was February, while they were still practicing, they were the season didn't start then until late February, early March. Anyhow, he said, Richard came to him and said, Richard, I want to put on a baseball clinic, my own baseball <laughs> clinic. And I had this big parking lot across the store from Steinberg's. Said I said, okay, Skip, why don't we put on a uh, – they said, I just want people to get to know me and my team. I said, okay, we'll set it for Saturday morning in my parking lot. You bring the team, and I'll run a newspaper ad. I said, good deal. So Saturday morning, 8, 8.30, Skip shows up with the baseball team, and they set up across the street in the parking lot. I block it off. And then there are cars everywhere on the street, cars under the interstate, and just crowded as could be in the store. And as Skip says, what the hell is going on? <laughs> he, he, he says, I've got two dads, one kid, and a dog out here. <laughs> for my baseball clinic, so he walks across the street and goes in the store, and I've got 300 people in the back of the store watching Ben Rogers Lee put on a turkey calling <laughs> clinic. <laughs> and Skip says, I got, I'm outdone, it'll never work. He said, I, just, I, I, can't, I can't outdo a turkey caller. Uh, so... Anyhow, we all know what a success Skip was, uh, did for LSU, put LSU baseball on the map. Uh, I was just looking at statistics the other night. I think it's, what, 35 straight years now that we've led the nation in attendance. In attendance. Yeah. Isn't that unbelievable? It's unbelievable. It's amazing. And it all started with him. Yeah. It all started with his vision. Uh, Richard Lipsy's joining us here. Remember, Edward Jones, get in touch with Daniel Newman, daniel.newman at edwardjones.com. Financial advisor. He can help you out with everything 401k, Social Security. Uh, when did you fall in love? When did you become passionate about higher education? Because it seems like out of all the fights that you fight, this is the one that you fight the fiercest. That That's true. Um, I've uh, it, well, it started when I got home and got involved. Uh, I joined the LSU Alumni Association. I joined the Cadets of the Old War School. Uh, but I, th I think my main affiliation came with what was then uh, uh, the school. I'm trying to think of what. The exact determination was it was uh, oceanography is actually what it was at LSU. It, it, they they had several departments in this building out there, old Quonset huts at LSU before the new Coast and Environment Building sure. was built, and they had several departments. Oceanography uh, w was one of them, and uh, environmental sciences and. You know, just several other departments, all that belonged in one group. And uh, I, I, Chuck Wilson was head of uh, oceanography. He and I became really good friends. 
you, you probably don't remember, but I was very involved with the Grand Isle Tarpon Rodeo. My dad was involved with it before me. He was president of the rodeo. I was president of the rodeo in the early 70s. Uh, and uh, I used to take people from that Department of Oceanography with me uh, to the rodeo, give them that experience of actual firsthand, being out there at the rigs and fishing, yeah. Yeah. having fun. So anyhow, that led to the Department of Oceanography and me getting more involved. And when Mark Emmert was here, I went to Mark and said, look, that you've got these eight or ten departments out there all under one roof, and but they don't really work together. What, what, what can I do? He says, well, let, wh why don't you get them to write a paper and come back to me and let's see what we can arrange. So anyway, I went back out there with nerve, uh, somebody with no affiliation, no, no, no authority at LSU, I got the heads of all these departments to write white papers on what the hell they did. <laughs> and I took them all back in a stack to Mark Emmert. He said, well, we'll make that the Department of Coastal Sciences. And then, then he changed his mind. No, we'll, we'll make it the School of Coastal Sciences, uh, CCNE, uh, uh, SCNE. And... So we did, got them all together, built them a new, beautiful new building, and it's got to be such an affluent part of LSU, they changed it to the College of Coast and Engineering, CCNE. And it's just one of the finest institutions at LSU. Well, because of that, and I was chairman of the advisory board, uh, which I was for 40 some odd years, and I've given scholarships to that college for 45, 46 years. Uh, and uh, so that, that, that really got me started. And then I got on the board, several other boards of colleges at LSU. I got heavily involved with athletics because of Skip. When uh, he was AD? He was, well, you no, know, it's still while he was baseball coach. 1987, uh, Ch Chancellor Warden came to me and said, we have a problem. We spent a lot of money on the stadium. LSU doesn't have any money to pay for it. Uh, you need to help me do something. So they had a whole, an organization called Tigers Unlimited, and we dissolved that and I decided that I would start a foundation that was separate from LSU. So we start, I started with the help of an attorney downtown, an organization, and I named it the Tiger Athletic Organization. Because it was a good TAF, it would be an easy sell. Yeah. I, anyhow, Chancellor Warden helped me get tickets in the press box, there was a north and south side of a press box, held about 400 people, maybe a little less, and he helped me get university to let me buy those tickets for Tiger Athletic Foundation and then resell them to people for a donation. And that's how Tiger Athletic Foundation was started wow. in 1987. Wow. Uh, John Ferguson. The voice. My first president. I had three employees. John Ferguson, Jamie Dirch, but it, her name now, of course, is Jamie Graham, still at LSU, still with TAF. And the third one I needed, after several months, I was working every day out there. And I, I, I said, I can't keep doing this. I said, I need one other person to help raise funds. And John Ferguson told me, well, there's a great young man over in the, the Alumni Association. His name's Rick Perry. Wow. So I went over to the Alumni Association, talked to Rick, and I hired him. So then I had three employees, and that's how we started. And in two, three years, we raised enough money 
to pay off the debt on the waterproofing of the stadium, which was hanging over yeah. LSU's head. And so just during that period, I, I was on so many different boards at LSU, and uh, Bobby Jindal appointed me to the Board of Regents. Right. Uh, actually appointed me to the Board of Commerce and Industry. And after about a year of that, I called him and said, you got to find another board for me. I, I just, I won't go into all the reasons, but I, I really was not comfortable being on the Board of Commerce and Industry. And so he appointed me to the Board of Regents. So I served on the Board of Regents. I served two terms as the chairman of the Board of Regents. And so I visited personally. I was the first person to visit every single college, four, four year institution in the state of Louisiana, every single one of them, technical colleges included. And I just made it my job that once a week I was going to either one or two colleges. And somebody from the office would go with me, and we went north to. Shreveport to LSU Shreveport, UNO, uh, Southern Shreveport, and the technical schools there. We went to Monroe. We went to Alexandria. We went to Lafayette, Lake Charles, New Orleans, everywhere. We visited every college in the state, and I got a really good working knowledge of what it takes to run a school. But more than that, I found out the needs of these schools and all of the uh, all of the repairs that had gone undone over the years, and money not put away from it for it, and what sad condition uh, many of our buildings were, leaky roofs, air conditionings that didn't work, uh, science rooms where the Burner, uh, Bunsen, Brunson, Bunsen burner. burners are, yeah. but the vents didn't work, so they couldn't use them. I mean, it, it, it was just walls cracking, leaking. So I spent six years literally trying to get money for uh, repairs for these buildings throughout the state. And I, I got some money from the state, but they're still behind through no fault of anybody except the budget of the state of Louisiana, and, and colleges are not budgeted enough money. I'll tell you, it, and, and yeah. uh, John Bell Edwards has done so much better than previous governors, but still there's only X amount of dollars he can pull from. So that that's one of the great needs in our universities in the state of Louisiana. How many authors have you been approached by? How many people have asked you to write a book? A lot. Will you write a book? A, a lot. Will you? I, I will. My daughter, as we speak, are, are talking to some uh, writers, and we're trying to find the right person. If you know of anybody, let me know. I will. <laughs> Absolutely will. Um, I, I, nobody knew a lot of the history. Everybody knew you as this, this, this figure that cared about LSU. I think that came to the forefront when... Put Louisiana com came to light. And then when the leadership at LSU was just not performing, you were the man that really stepped up for this state, it felt like, and brought in to what now feels like the right people in the right place. Can you can you take me back to that time around the Joe Oliva, F. King Alexander, and the Put Louisiana First? Well, let, me, let me take you back before that. Yes, sir. I, I've been very friendly, luckily, all these years with all of the presidents of LSU. I, I, I go back to Troy Middleton, who was, when I was in high school was a very close friend of my parents. And then John Hunter, his son was in my class at the lab school. And just all the presidents and chancellors through the years I, I knew all of them. And then there was Mark Emmert. Hmm. And when Mark Emmert came to LSU, LSU began to change so much for the better. Yeah. Uh, it's been said that 
Mark Emmert did in five years at LSU, which most people would have taken 20 years to do. He turned us around, raised the grade point average, raised the SAT scores, raised the ACT scores. He said, we may have a little drop in uh, uh, the number of students going to LSU for a year or two, but as we create the demand for we're going to be a better school, it will rise, and it did. And as the scores improved on the kids that we were letting in LSU, the number of students improved. The faculty, we got better faculty. People knew we were serious about higher education at LSU. We were looking into the future and not the past. And that's what Mark Emmert brought to LSU. Every single night at his residence over on the lake, he would entertain legislators. He would entertain faculty. He would entertain students. He would entertain business people. It it, it was something every single night going on. He was a great fundraiser. He was a great speaker. He was a great... He should have been president of LSU. He was a chancellor, but we had a president, and he was brought in as chancellor. Was that William Jenkins at the time? Bill Bill Jenkins, right, and very nice man. But Mark ran LSU. But that's why today, and we'll get into that in just a second, we need a president. We don't need a president and a chancellor because the the president— Too confusing, right? Well, right. The president— has to give the chancellor the ability to run the school. and the, So what's the president going to do? Where if we get a single president, he can hire vice president to take care of, say, the two agricultural schools. He can hire a financial vice president to take care of finances and then one more vice president to take care of LSU uh in Shreveport, and LSU in Alexandria, and LSU in Eunice, and most particularly run the med school, which is a full-time job in itself. And so many LSU presidents have gotten tied up. I'm talking about since Mark Emmert, have gotten tied up in working with the uh, med school. They've completely ignored the flagship. And, And so... Quite honestly, you, you wanted me to get to that subject. That's what happened mm-hmm. with King Alexander. He got so tied up with the med school and what's going on there, he completely ignored LSU. Now, some people say, well, that's the reason we don't need to go back to a chancellor and a president. No, not at all. He came from a very small college on the West Coast, they didn't have a graduate school. They, they, they didn't have a research and development. They didn't have a law school. They didn't have an ag school. He came from a, from a high school type operation to running a flagship university. And I'm sorry, I don't, stepping on toes, but he knew nothing about running a major college. And unfortunately, and people have heard me say it, and I've written articles about it on my website, Put Louisiana First, uh, he was just a bad fit yeah. for LSU. Yeah. He didn't. He knew nothing about a flagship, and he almost ruined our graduate school, and we totally lacked in research and development. Uh, we lost uh, all a lot of grants we were getting. We lost, but it it just it was a pitiful situation. Yeah. He got rid of really good people that LSU had, mm-hmm. and brought in all outsiders. None of them knew a darn thing about LSU, and um, and of course, even before he got here, the board had hired Joe Oliva, who. The people at Duke said, don't hire him. It was unbelievable. You know, don't hire this man. 
And, and uh, I don't know why to this day that they did. Uh, but it, anyhow, I, yeah, I, no, I, I, I don't you, want to. No, I know what you, but I know what you, but I know what you mean, mean because I remember that. that. It was just a bad fit. It, it was, it was, it was, it was too a bad, bad fit. fit. And uh, you, you let, let me, I'll tell you two things about Joe Oliva. One is that if you ever went to a football game or a baseball game, he was pretty much always there up in his box. Mm -hmm. He never one time came out of his box at the football stadium and came down to West Stadium or the boxes and shook hands and said, so glad you're here. Thank you. For to the customers. You, the customers. Right. He, ne he would go in his box, close the door and right. lock it and never leave his box. The same thing in a basketball game. He'd go sit in his seats, chewing gum <laughs> the whole time, <laughs> and never, ever say hello to anybody. And I'm sorry. He, 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 he just was a bad, bad fit for LSU. That position has to be personable. And, and, and of course, I won't go into other details about King Alexander, but Thank goodness it took about a year of articles, but I'm proud of the Board of Supervisors. They woke up and um, got some good people on the Board of Supervisors that realized LSU was going in that direction instead of that direction. And they made the move and, uh, you know, first got rid of Joe Oliva and brought in a fabulous yeah. athletic director and then just a few months later got rid of King Alexander and they're in the middle of their search for a new president. And I'm very confident they're going to bring in a, a top-notch person. I could talk to you about so much more um, and keep you for so much time, but I want to respect you and I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll end here. Um, you have empowered a ton of people and given a lot of people opportunity um, but the one that I look at is your daughter, Lori, who is one of the most powerful women in our state uh, with running Lipsies and running Haspels. Um, talk about what she means to your operation and what is your day to day life like now? What is what is what is uh, this Wednesday look like for Mr. Lipsy? Well, we're running out of time yeah. here. I see <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. I have two wonderful, wonderful wife and two wonderful daughters, Lori and Wendy. Wendy, as you know, is a plant, transplant recipient, yes, sir. and she's become the state speaker for LOPA, Louisiana, Oregon, uh, transplant, yes, uh, and she just does a marvelous job going around the state uh, recruiting people to sign up to donate life uh, when they pass away, and uh, she's really into that and just does a hell of a job speaking for her. Lopa. Uh, Laurie went into the business when she moved back from Atlanta in 1993, and I desperately needed help. She had no intention of going to work for me, but I convinced her to do it. And over the years, you know, she went from being working in credit to uh, uh, managing operations and so on and so forth. And she literally took over running the business. I mean, practically every day, day by day, right after 2000. And I made her the president. And then about seven, eight years ago, uh, uh, I made her the, she really became the CEO of the company. Yeah. And, but she's changed the face of the company, the way they work. I was a micromanager. Laurie's a macro manager. And like you said, Laurie today, she's, chairman of the whole sporting goods industry, the chairman of the National Association of Sporting Goods Wholesalers. And then recently, just the last two weeks, she's been appointed to the board of the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is all the manufacturers uh, run the National Shooting Sports Foundation. And she's the only non-manufacturer on the board of NSSF. Oh, so testament. she's she's 
out and around and well respected. Yeah. But she she respected because of the way she runs the business and the way she works with the industry and uh, our her passion, my passion is you know that business. I go to the office. I work on my personal investments and the things that I like to do. Laurie runs a business. Yeah. She's got Flint Verges, Warren Verges, I mentioned. Right. Warren worked for me until he retired. And before Warren retired, I, I, I hired Flint, his son, who was a graduate of Southeastern and was in the banking business. Now Flint is president of the company. Uh, Laurie is the chairman and the CEO. And I'm... I gave myself the title of founder. Good for you. Which means I, do, I don't do anything with the business. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take care of my own business, and Laurie's nice enough to let me have an office. I can say firsthand, <laughs> I have been to that beautiful office in Industrial Plex, and you still have the best office in the joint. I so do. It, it is, uh, it's all added up. Uh, but, but real quick, last one. Our city, Baton Rouge, you, you, you are very passionate about that as well. Um, how do you feel about the future of, of where our city is? I know that you were very outspoken on St. George. Um, well, I was. I'm, I'm totally against St. George. Uh, there's no reason to split up our city. It would be ridiculous if uh, a, a big company said, Amazon, I'm looking to come to Baton Rouge. Well, uh, I'm looking to come to St. George, <laughs> you know. Baton Rouge is the capital of the state of Louisiana. We, we've got the largest population in the state, in, in East Baton Rouge Parish and the surrounding area. And we have a great chamber of commerce. We've got the Committee of 100. State government is here. You, you cannot split up the city of Baton Rouge like they did Atlanta in other cities and see what, see what happened to them when they split up and the downtown died. And we've got all the state offices. But we've got great areas of Baton Rouge. But nobody could. You tell me, I'm going out to St. George for lunch. Where would you go? I don't, nobody's ever heard of that. You know, I can go to Baker. You know, I can go to Zachary. Those are towns. But, but no, St. George, don't split us up. But there is a problem, and the problem has to be faced. Let's get back. Pure public education. I know we're out no, of time. No, 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 we're not. You go, you go ahead. We're good. You go ahead. But go I, ahead. Do, I, I do want to say that we, we've got a new school superintendent here, Cito Narcisse, a brilliant guy. He came from Washington a school system. He's been in several other school systems. I've talked to him repeatedly, had a Zoom session with him yesterday, and he's really on top of the school system here. I am firmly convinced that the East Baton Rouge Parish public school system and the charter schools can coexist. Charter schools are terrific. They, they specialize whether it be in STEM or whether it be in music or the arts or whatever. And, and, but some of them are just general public schools. Remember, charter schools are public schools. They're funded with public school money. The only difference is a private organization has to come in and build the building. But they hire the teachers and the principal, and they run a charter school like a business. And that's what Dr. Uh, Narcisse has to do. He's got to get our public school system running like a charter school. He's got to get rid of the failing teachers and the failing principals. He's got to move them around, and we've got to get these schools in. We need more discipline in the schools. The truancy is awful, like 30% a day. At, at some schools in the East Baton Rouge Parish. This all has to be corrected. And there's no reason at all that our public school system, East Baton Rouge public school system, cannot be run 
like a charter school is. And I think they've hired the right man to do it. But Baton Rouge, East Baton Rouge Parish, will never flourish to the extent that we all want it to until we get our kids educated. And that starts with pre-K. That starts when they're two and three years old. And Governor Edwards has done a good job of that, but we're not there yet. We need to do a better job. We need to put more money in pre-K. We need to get these kids socialized, every young child socialized when they're two and three and four years old so that when they hit pre-K and the first grade, you know, their ability to learn to read and write and arithmetic is so much better. And we need to get these kids staying in school. We need to educate them. When they graduate from high school in Louisiana, if you don't want to go to a four-year college, you don't have to. We've got the greatest technical school system in the state, in any state. Mm-hmm. Right here in Louisiana, you can learn to be a welder or an automobile mechanic or, or a helicopter repairman. We've got so many technical schools in Louisiana, and we're starting to bring that down into the high schools. Yeah. Yes. You can't imagine. Yeah, Walker High School Walker. is incredible. You, you cannot imagine graduating, the, how much a person that doesn't graduate from high school but goes to work He's gonna make anywhere from twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a year if he's lucky. A person that graduates from high school is gonna make thirty thousand dollars a year. But a kid with a certificate, man or woman, with a one-year certificate, they're gonna make forty to fifty thousand dollars a year. And a person with a two-year training certificate. Out, out of high, that's graduated from high school, it's a two year certificate, they're going to make eighty to $100,000 a year. It's just education. Now, if you graduate from high school and you go to college and you get a degree, then you know, you're going to make, depending on what you graduate in, I mean, if you fluff through and you sure. know, just don't do anything except take required courses and graduate, you know, you're going to go look for a job and be lucky to get a job. But if you graduate in a specialty, you know, engineering, education, uh, finance, business, oceanography, you're you're going to get a $100,000-plus job easily. And, And But more importantly, you become an effective member of society. And then you become a leader. And that's what we need, more leaders. Your leaders are the ones that do go to college and graduate and become anything from professors, doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs. Right, sure. And we need both. We need the Indian chiefs and we need the Indians. And we need we need, we need the people, the workers, but we need trained workers in this state. And we don't have enough trained workers. And that's why it's so important these kids get an early education. We start them pre-K, give them a good foundation in grammar school, high school, and then college. But as I said, every kid is not cut out to go to college. But there are plenty of places he can go to learn to be a technician, uh, plumber, electrician, whatever. It's just we need to focus on the primary education. I am, uh, I speak for for people in in this room. I'm I'm very excited and thankful that you are fighting for our state. I I appreciate what you do for, for us every day. And I don't know if, if you hear that in your position, because I think that there is a lot of people out there that are very thankful and grateful for just your presence every day. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming here this morning. Just a couple of comments. 
one team, one podcast inside of the bunker. I muted my work conference call so I could listen to the rest of this interview. <laughs> Nick Perino says, I worked my way through college working for Mr. Lipsy at Lipsy's. He was a great boss and a great mentor. Carol Foles says, Jordy, there's no question. This is the best interview I've ever heard. Awesome job. Tom Granning says, please have him back. Uh, Jeff Marcon says, Mr. Lipsy's wisdom and storytelling in this time is legendary. Um, just a couple of the words of support. Thank you, thank you very much for being here. I, I cannot thank, thank you, you enough. Uh, Jordy, I've enjoyed it very much. You have a good program. Uh, you've taught me how to listen to a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I've got something new. My wife listened to this Great. morning, and uh, hopefully my daughter in New York is listening. Uh, she had to run up to New York for a quick trip, and uh, Wendy's listening. I know it. I know my grandson, Luke. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, he listens to you. Matter of fact, he showed me how to listen to you. How <laughs> the boy Luke. Let's go, Luke. My boy right there, Luke. And, uh, and Luke's my baseball fan and a baseball partner. And uh, What's it like being a grandfather? Fixes everything I need fixed. What's it like being a grandfather? Well, you realize I've got three grandchildren. Uh, one's 25, you know, works for Saks in New York. Just she left and uh, graduated, and I, I'm just so hopeful that that she'll go get a uh, MBA while she's in New York. But she loves working as a buyer uh, for Sachs, and uh, Luke is a senior at Southeastern this year, so he graduates and has no idea what he wants to do when he graduates. But he, I know he'll do well. With whatever he does, and Marla, uh, my youngest, is 21, and she's a junior at Arizona. Wow! And she does, you know, interested in filmmaking and uh, uh, other type of uh, work uh, in the arts. So I've got three great grandchildren, and uh, I'm very fortunate. It's great to see you. Good to see you, Jordy. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Lipsy. Thank you very much. We will come back in uh, about three minutes and close this thing out. Thank you.